There it is. Welcome, everybody. Time for another session. Um, I think this is meal planning uh, that Scott's taking the lead on. And um, we also have uh, Velvet, who's going to participate. And whoever else wants to jump in uh, can be helpful as time goes on. Uh, we normally start out with asking who's new and how did you find out about the classes? And I think most everybody's been here before, but if <clears throat> I I don't recognize everybody's name, but if you this is the first class you've come to, if you could just unmute and say hello, how you found out about the class, we're always curious. So you to find the unmute button, it's usually you have to come down to the bottom of your screen, drag your mouse, and you'll see a microphone, and you just have to kind of click on it. It's like we have everybody back while you're talking. <laughs> all right well yeah tonight will be two parts meal preparation and planning so i'll go over a bunch of stuff that's on the website and this is classes recorded so even though i might go through it kind of fast it might seem like a lot of information remember you can go back and watch the recording of this and get uh, get to the resources you need and then after i'm done with what i want to present here then uh, velvet one of our class attendees who's been been coming for a long time she has some good uh, ideas and she presented this before and it was really, really helpful for people. So I'll have her do a presentation and I believe if whatever time we have left and then next week, uh, Charlie will be kind of, I'm assuming you're gonna go through the, what, how you guys prepare stuff in the kitchen with Christine and all that, like you did, you've done in the past. Yeah. Yeah, sounds good. And then we'll even have an open forum the week after that. So it'll be a good time for people to ask lots and lots of questions, chime in. Uh, other people that have been here for a while, you might want to chime in as well and give people some, the pe some people that are newer here, some tips on how to meal prep and plan and how to get started if, if there's people that are just getting started. Before we start, does anybody else have any comments, questions, anything? Guess we have our quorum. Uh, yeah, we have a quorum, and we don't uh, have any hands up that I see. Um, so, no one has any questions, any thoughts, anything they're curious about before we get started. Just right. either raise your hand or just unmute and say hello. I have a quick question. Sure. Can you tell me anything about vertigo? Is it, um, do you know anything about that? I can tell you it can be a complicated uh, topic <laughs> for sure. Uh, you know, there's uh, vertigo is oftentimes associated with a spinning sensation as opposed to just a lightheadedness. Lightheadedness can occur from a number of things like dehydration and stuff, but true vertigo, you usually have movement involved. It usually involves your inner ear. Uh, I suspect it could be some brain-related issue as opposed to an inner ear issue. Um, but um, it's one of those topics that I would take up with an ear, nose, and throat specialist. There's nothing that I could say hey, you know, here's a, a quick fix. Now, there are some very benign conditions associated with vertigo. It's called benign positional vertigo. And there are some maneuvers called ap Epley maneuvers, which you can kind of, if you have, you have some crystals in your inner semicircular canals, they can get displaced if you've been on an airplane ride or if you've been high up in the mountains, or if you suddenly jerk your head, and these, these uh, otoliths or these crystals get displaced, 
you can put them back into place. You can actually do it yourself if you know how to do it, or you can get coached by sometimes a primary care provider will help you do the Epley maneuvers. Um, and then there are some more serious causes, but that's a benign one, which I've seen a number of times, which has helped clear people's vertigo. The main problem with doing it on your own is that uh, you tend to be nauseated. It, you have to tilt your head way back on a table and then you come back up and it can cause you some significant nausea and discomfort. So you need someone who's around to help coach you for the first time you learn how to do these maneuvers. If you want, you can send me an email. I'll talk to you on the phone about it more. Well, um, three years ago, I had vertigo and I went down to Bozeman to a vertical specialist and they did 16 different things on me. And they said, um, one thing could be is that there's, you're taking in too much salt. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, I don't have salt in my diet because I've taken all the salt out. And she says, well, is there salt in any, do you buy any canned foods? Oh, well, you know, yes. So I, I started to pressure cook my beans and then all my vertigo went away. So huh. I don't know if it was just the salt I, I don't know, but I did try the Epley maneuver and that didn't work for me. Um, you know, I just, it just went away. All right. Well, um, if the salt maneuver worked, great. It helps you in other things also, not just. If oh, I know, I know. <laughs> I, don't you want know. Those, I want to keep those endothelial cells strong. Yeah. You know, salt can be quite inflammatory. So you want to try to avoid uh, a significant amount of that. Right. Okay. Trouty. I had vertigo uh, about a year ago, <clears throat> and uh, mine was caused by medication. So the medication was taken off, but mine was not spinning. Mine was like the window goes up and down, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, weird, but uh, it made me nauseous too. I could hardly walk with it. And at first they thought it was some nerve thing. And it turned out it wasn't. As soon as they'd taken off the medication, it stopped. It was caused by medication. Yeah. The wonders of modern medicine. The side effects are, can be problematic for sure. Yeah. Okay, Scott. Yeah. Carry on. Okay, let me share my screen. There you go. You, you'd muted me, so I had to unmute. There you go. Let me share. You, you can hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Okay. Optimize. That wasn't very nice of me. Oh, a, you're just muting the room sometimes. That yeah, happens. I was trying to get make it quiet for you. All right. I made it okay. too quiet. So this is the uh, class website, livelifestylemedicine.com for anyone that's new. And if you admit, if this is, I, feel, I think we determined there wasn't anyone new, but in case you missed any of the last two weeks of classes, the introduction classes, they're here under the class archives. You can see last week's here scrolling down the homepage. Here was last week's class. And then if you want two weeks ago class, the first one of the year, you just go to class archives and click on 2024 classes. And here's the first one, January 2nd. So you can watch that, those two classes if you've missed the last two weeks. Let's go back to the home page. So meal preparation planning, I want to go over a few resources here. So we're going to start off into the recipes section. So let's click on recipes. And I wanted to show that the holiday meal planning recipes, of course, we just passed the holidays, but you know, it, there's a lot of good recipes here. If you click on it, um, it's a really, it's a meal planner as well. So it gives you uh, good recipes for, for Thanksgiving and Christmas, which we just came out of, but um, you can make them anytime. It's just a, if you have a big group coming over and you want to prepare a, a really holiday like meal, then this is a really good resource. So it, has, it t tells you, it gives you a shopping list, tells you how, what day to start what, and it's a really helpful thing, but you can also remember this for next holiday season. 
So let me go out of there. So that's one. And then the quick reference guide to cooking whole grains here. It's just a little cheat sheet of as you're cooking different grains, how much how much grain, how much part liquid and how long to, to simmer it. It gives, it gives a little cheat sheet here. It's really, really handy for all the different types of whole grains. So we always talk about whole grains in these classes. This is what we're talking about. You know, the amaranth, the farro, the millet, barley, brown rice, wild rice, bulgur, all those different things. So there's that. Next, I wanna show uh, cooking tips and tricks. This is from uh, Dr. McDougall's wife, Mary McDougall, same one that did the holiday meal planning and recipes. This is a really good resource. It's uh, a whole article. You just wanna read through it. Gives you tips for, you know, how to saute without oil, for example, um, how to cook different grains. And she also has a little cheat sheet on, on uh, how long to cook different grains and how much grain versus water, similar. Um, different meal substitutions, cookware, just a lot, a lot of really, because she's been cooking whole food plant-based since the 1970s. So she has a lot of really good uh, tips and tricks on cooking. So definitely a resource to read through and see if there's anything that will be helpful to you. So I won't go through any more of it here, but I just wanted to show you that that's a great resource. A lot of this is, you know, we can spend some time in class hearing people's ideas and stuff, which is great. But, you know, you'll have kind of, it's nice to have all these different resources you can refer to ongoing with from the website. And then cooking, you know, we can, we did cooking tips and tricks. And then there's actual recipes here. Um, if you scroll down, we, we had, we, we had opened it up to, class participants to submit recipes. And we had a few, but uh, with the Facebook group and everything, more people were, sh were sharing there. And then there's so many cookbooks and stuff. So, um, you know, it hasn't really exploded, which is fine because it, you know, takes a little effort to post them in here. And then there's like copyright issues and stuff with some of the recipes. So, uh, but there are a few here. We have uh, a bunch from the potluck we had back in pre-pandemic back in 2019. We have a bunch of pictures and recipes here. So you can look through some of those, but there's lots of other places to look for recipes. Just wanted to show you that. Now let's go back to the resources page. So we did recipes, now the resources page. And I wanna go through some links to cookbooks. So this is not an exhaustive list, but a good list of whole food plant-based recipes, some of our favorites. And, we, and all these resources I'm showing you, we don't have any financial ties to any of it, just a a good good resource for ourselves and other participants and patients we've had and things that that uh, use and there's links to these on Amazon if you wanted to get them yourself so there's a whole list of them here that are really great ones different cookbooks that we recommend we'll just scroll through those for you there's even a slow cooker cookbook and an instapot cookbook and we've made I've my wife and I made a lot from this instapot cookbook it's really good some of my favorite recipes are in this one here um, but also this is the, the slow cooker one is good. If you don't can't afford a instant pot, there's also slow cooker ones here. They're all whole food plant-based. So there's that. And let's go back up, close this. Next would be links to websites with recipes and meal plans here. And let's see if it'll... Oh, there we go. So forksoverknives.com has a whole bunch of recipes, Dr. McDougall. So I can, I can click on it with the forks over knives one. You can um, just go right to recipes and, and there's whole hundreds of free recipes here. They also have a meal planner. I think that costs a little bit of money and they send you recipes every week and uh, shopping lists and all that. So if you kind of want to have a whole meal plan and things like that, you can do the forks over knives meal planner, but they do have, again, lots of free recipes there. And so let's close that one. And then Dr. McDougall also has a bunch of free recipes on his website right here. So you can just click on recipes and he has a whole bunch, different categories. Um, so he has off also offers lots of free recipes on his website. And then Monkey and Me Kitchen Adventures is another really good one. And you can shop for you know, different, like put in ingredients and it'll like show you, oh, I have, I have a bunch of sweet potatoes. So click on search sweet potatoes and then it'll pull up recipes that that utilize that you can also just do random searches here for all different kinds of recipes breakfast lunches and dinners snacks appetizers things like that so that's also a really good website for recipes and then um, let's see another one is uh, okay let's get out of 
Oh, 21 day kickstart also has a, uh, like a meal plan. So if you kick on, click on 21 day kickstart, you can sign up for that. And it starts the first of every month for 21 days and they send you recipes and it's all whole food plant-based. So you can, you can sign up there and that's, that's free. And yeah, that's the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. Let's go out here and go to, I'll oh, go back to resources. And next one's plant-based meal ideas for traveling. Let's see here, right here, plant-based meal ideas for traveling. So this is a really good article. Uh, it's a pretty long one, but it's it gives you all kinds of ideas of what you need for our, from as far as uh, what what things you can take with you on a longer trip if you're gonna try to cook where you are. And then it also gives you um, ideas for things to pack and uh, also eating out, what kind of things you can you can get when you're on the road. And so it's a lot of really good, and there's there's a whole bunch of recipes here too. Things that, that, things that you can kind of uh, cook ahead of time and pack easily and take with you. So that's a really good article for that. And let's see here. Next is on the last thing on this resources page I have is Whole Harvest is a, another resource. So it's a little spendy, but if you're getting started or you're just wanna have some meals around that you don't have to cook at all and they just get mailed to you, it's all oil-free, low salt, whole food, plant-based, whole harvest. And so you can choose your meals and they ship them to you and they're vacuum sealed. So you, they can last you know two to three weeks in your, in your fridge or you can freeze actually freeze them. And there's a lot of good recipes. I've tried a few. I just ordered some more just to have around because uh, now my wife's uh, taking care of our granddaughter a bit. It'll be, it'll be harder to cook every night. And so um, and I can create, you know, make easy things for myself and she can too. And, but, you know, occasionally I might just want to throw something in the microwave from, from here. And so there's these whole harvest meals. It's, that's a really good good resource, but again, a little, a little spendy. It's kind of similar to eating out if you think about it that way. Maybe a little bit cheaper if you count the, you know, no tip and if you're not getting alcoholic beverage or something like that, but, but that's where, you know, eating out really gets a lot more expensive. Uh, so there's that. And then now I want to go to handouts from classes. So we're still on the resources page, but a subcategory here, handouts from classes. Let's click on that. And I got food substitution chart. I wanted to show you guys right here. And so it just kind of gives you, uh, you know, what things you can use as a meat alternative and egg substitutes, dairy alternatives. Just this is from PCRM. It's just a nice little little handout um, you can read through. And it's when you're cooking different things, some of your favorite recipes. If you're just trying to substitute out the animal product and in a, in a healthier alternative, this is a nice little resource here. And then I want to show you meal building basics right here. And this is a really simple form. So this is what I give out uh, when, I, when I have a brand new patient a lot of times. And this is a handout that if somebody would have given me when I first started eating this way, you guys, some, most of you were at my introduction class. But when I first started out, I was doing this on my own. I was, my wife wasn't interested at all. And this has been 11 years ago now. And, and so I bought cookbooks and stuff and I wasn't very knowledgeable on cooking or in the kitchen. So I really kind of struggled a bit. And so if somebody would have given me a handout like this at that time, this would have been really helpful because uh, you, don't, I, you don't even with this handout, you don't even have to really cook. There's no recipe to follow. It's just a idea of how to build a meal, kind of meal building basics. And this first page just kind of gives you the philosophy, start with the starch, add vegetables, and you can read through it. And it talks about sauteing without oil here. It gives you the, 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 how to, the process of doing that. You can also watch it on YouTube. A lot of people sauteing, water saute, vegetable broth, vegetable stock. So it gives you the kind of the, pro, the process of how to saute without using oil. And then on this side, it's just examples of <clears throat> breakfast, lunches, and dinners with just kind of that's that theme, start with the starch, add vegetables. And so you got Mexican theme, Italian theme, Asian theme, or the European Ireland theme. So you can kind of guess what your starch is in each of these, right? Mexican would be beans and rice. Italian would be pasta, go whole wheat pasta. Asian would be brown rice, noodles. 
and the Northern European Ireland would be potato, right? So, so those are your starches, and then you just build and add on to that. You can kind of make bowls and things like that. Um, so it's a really, like I said, I would have just done this probably for the, when I first started out, because it would have been really easy just to kind of think of it this way. So, um, so those of you that are new and want something really simple, that's a good resource for you. Meal building basics. And then and next, I want to show you no oil salad dressing area. Let's see here. I got a handout here, no oil salad dressings. Again, we're still under handouts from class and no oil salad dressings. And disclaimer, there are, there's like 34 recipes here, I think, for salad dressings. I, actually, there are two that have oil in them and they're Asian, two different Asian dressings. So you could omit it there or just avoid those two if you're trying to lose weight and avoid the oil but all the other ones are oil free so um, it's a pdf file you can download and or just print off or whatever and just lots of great salad dressing recipes you can you have access to here so i know that's always a big issue and then the last thing i want to show you it's a little bit more involved handout is called the meal planning ideas handout right here you click on that. Let me go ahead and download it so it looks bigger. Everybody with me? Okay, we're doing okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good pace. Here. Okay, good. I know it's a lot there, but I, like I said earlier, it's this is being recorded, so you can go back and and watch it again. And so this meal planning ideas is that, just to go down to the bottom, just to show you I have the resources here. Some of the books that. I showed in, in recipe websites I showed you at the beginning here are listed here. So let's start with the resources. So Plant Powered Families Cookbook by Drina Burton, the Forks Overnized Cookbook here, the China Study All-Star Collection by Leanne Campbell, the Monkey and Me Kitchen Adventures website. Uh, this is another one, minimalistbaker.com recipes slash vegan. So those, those are the resources I have for all of the recipes that I kind of um, reference here. But let's go back to the top. Just to kind of run through and give you an idea. So for breakfast, I know for me, I uh, was for, gosh, 10 years, I was just doing regular rolled oats, you know, Quaker oats to get them at Costco. And I was doing that. But in the last year or so, Charlie got me on to oat groats. And so I really love those now. So I'm doing oat groats every day now, which is just, I just take oat groats. I get them for 69 cents a pound at, at uh, Winco. And I, um, put them, I cook them in my Instapot. So it's just, but actually I eat a lot. So it's three cups in my Instapot dry. And then I put in four and a half cups of water and then it cooks for 40 minutes in my Instapot. And then it slow releases for 30 minutes. And I had, that's my groats for the entire week. And I did it every day for breakfast. So I put in like <clears throat> a tablespoon of flax meal. I put on cinnamon. I put on blueberries, a little bit of cocoa powder often. Um, a handful of nuts and then my oat milk on on that and usually at work I just kind of eat on it all morning because I you know between patients I just take a few bites and then go and it really satisfies me throughout the whole morning um, when I'm on my days off I just you know eat the whole bowl at once and I'm usually good for <laughs> sometimes I eat still eat a small lunch and a smaller dinner but that really fills me up for quite a while uh, but that's so that's a really good idea for breakfast I'm more of a a savory person or I mean a sweet person for breakfast you know I, I know it'd be better to do like beans and gra other grains and maybe some leafy greens and things like that I just haven't ever you know done that for myself I just really I guess because I was always eating like sweet cereal and garbage when I gr was growing up I've always like Captain Crunch and stuff like that so I kind of had that sweet I guess I just grew up wanting the sweet for breakfast. And so that's kind of fulfills that for me, but it's of course the sweet now is just fruit. And I oh, actually put a few raisins in there too. So the, so the blueberries, the raisins, that's what gives me the, the sweet. And then, uh, then the rest is just the, the groats and, and stuff. And then, uh, so here's just an example of, you know, besides oatmeal, you could also do other cooked grains like bulgur, farro, brown rice, barley, you know, add dried fruit, the nuts, the flax meal, like I was mentioning, cinnamon, cocoa powder, other fresh fruit, strawberries, bananas, and then the unsweetened nut milks to moisten it. Uh, so that's just one idea. Of course, there's also, you know, you can do tofu scrambles and things. And I'm sure other people will talk about some of the their other favorite uh, breakfast recipes. But in, in this cookbook, uh, Plant Powered Families, there's an almond zen granola recipe you can make. 
Um, also just uh, frozen fruit and green smoothies is a good way to get your, some servings of fruits and vegetables in. So you can do that. Those are just some breakfast ideas. Uh, one of my favorites for lunch is usually just dinner leftovers, but you can also do things like sandwiches using hummus instead of mayonnaise, just lettuce, tomato, cucumber, avocado, uh, put it on like a, a Dave's Killer Bread, a really good whole grain bread. There's a re good recipe in Plant Powered Families Cookbook for a chickpea salad sandwich. I know, uh, I believe Velvet's shared that she's d done that one for traveling and stuff too. She likes the chickpea salad sandwich. Um, potato meets egg salad sandwich is another uh, type of a kind of a substitution for an egg salad sandwich. Uh, another a recipe there. You can also do cut up vegetables for a side and fruit for dessert. Kind of with it, all meals, you can always think of fruit as your dessert as ideally. There's also a recipe for a hummus here. You can, cause you wanna try to, you know, most of the store-bought hummuses usually contain oil or at least the, the tahini, which is the ground up sesame seeds. And those are, you know, tend to be high in fat. So if you're trying to lose weight, you wanna try to avoid those, but weight's not an issue and you're trying to get a few more calories. It's not the worst thing. Um, so there's that. And then kind of like to give people ideas, traditional meals, I know we, a lot of times in the classes, we talk about keeping it simple as far as just having some grains, having some beans, having some greens, you know, and, and that's really healthy. And that's ultimately the, probably the best thing, especially trying to keep it simple and kind of follow Dr. Greger's daily dozen. But, you know, some people when they're starting out and I was this way, that's kind of what part of the reason I created this handout is, you know, they're more used to like traditional things like like lasagna and spaghetti. And so, you, so you know, if you're ready to jump all the way in to be real simple and do all the Dr. Greger's do daily dozen, you might, some people are ready for that, some people aren't. And so if you're not then, and you wanna kind of identify with things that are kind of more familiar to you, then uh, there's a lot of good ideas here. So there's a veggie skillet lasagna in the Monkey Me Kitchen Ventures recipe or cookbook or on the, actually that's a website. And then uh, easy grillable veggie burgers here. You can do home fries, like in your air fryer, you can cut up sweet potatoes or Yukon Golds or red potatoes and, and put them in the air fryer and there's your fries. There's a vegan meatballs recipe, chili, a chili sauce, mashed potatoes. Of course, you can always do steamed vegetables for a side and again, the fruit for dessert. There's a crispy baked tofu nuggets recipe. Uh, of course, mashed potatoes and steamed vegetables as a side dish. Uh, vegan skillet chicken and dumplings, which you know, a lot of people kind of have that have that comfort food, chicken and dumplings kind of thing. But of course, it's a vegan version of it. Now, soups are always really good, especially in the wintertime. Vegetable soups, bean soups, potatoes. You can kind of almost create a soup just by dumping in whatever you have, like whatever cut up vegetables you still have, leftover potatoes, puts in, you know, get those dollar can of beans, put several different kinds of beans in there. It's really easy to kind of throw together a soup and that can last you all week. Or if you don't want to get too tired of it, you eat it for a couple of days and then freeze it in little, little individual sized uh, containers. And then you can thaw them out for meals another time. So like, it's always good to kind of, you're going up, going to the to the trouble of cutting up a bunch of vegetables and different things. You might as well go ahead and, and make a big batch and then you can freeze it. So then you, you put in the work. So you might as well, benefit from that for other meals later on and other people can the class can can chime in on that going forward too and have, have that have, might have more experience with that than myself and then different pastas so whole wheat spaghetti there's also the red lentil pastas and quinoa pastas that you can also use and then of course instead of a, a meat sauce or a Alfredo sauce, you would just do a tomato-based marinara sauce and stir fry in a bunch of onions, mushrooms, peppers, zucchini, garlic, spinach, throw it all in there, make it a nice chunky um, uh, marinara sauce. And if you're newer to this and you're not quite, or, or you have kids even that don't like a lot of vegetables in their, in their sauce, you can also just blend it, blend up, blend it up. You can even throw beans in the sauce, throw in vegetables in the sauce and just blend it and make it, still make it a smooth sauce and they don't even really know what's in there. So, so that's a good good alternative. And there's some uh, recipes here for tomato sauce, a creamy fettuccine. Uh, and I, I know they use the creamy fettuccine, the different creamy sauces that they have in the plant, bar, 
and the plant-based cookbooks tend to be uh, cashew-based and so a little nutritional yeast and things like that. And so it's still a little high in calories because of the nuts, but but it definitely a better alternative than than dairy. So, and then there's a no cheese mac and cheese. And then don't ever forget salads are always a good meal. But the thing I always like to talk about when you, and you can read through this, I won't read through it here now, but um, having salad as a meal, you want to make sure you add lots of starches to it. Because if you just do non-starchy vegetables, then it's your, your, you might be full eating a giant salad initially, but an hour or two later, you're going to be hungry because everything in that non-starchy vegetable salad is going to be under 100 calories per pound. And so, you you know, when I make a salad, it's usually in a big mixing bowl. People laugh because it's like, because it's so low in calories. And so you want to make sure you, to make it more satisfying and make it last longer, you want to put in starchy vegetables like cooked, which would be like cooked grains, beans, nuts, seeds, baby red potatoes, or those fingerling potatoes, avocado. Um, and so think of, think of those, you know, starchy vegetables as well. And you want to put lots of those in there too, because that'll fill you up more. You'll actually feel more satisfied with that and not feel like, because if you eat this big salad, no starch, then like an hour or two later, you're people tend to crave things like meat and cheese and, and the bad stuff. So you want to get those starches in there. Of course, fruit for dessert. And then a potato as a meal kind of, this kind of goes back to that meal building basics I was talking about earlier, you know, having your starch as your, as your base, and then you add vegetables to that. So this is a good reminder of that potato as a meal. And then of course, stir fries, you know, so pretty much a lot of you think can you might be thinking a lot of ethnic foods, you know, so Asian stir fries and Mexican food, you know, so we you know, talk about I, with my, especially my patients that either really like Mexican food or, or, um, or people, or it's my Spanish speaking or people from Latin American countries, I tell them the three sisters of, of, Lat of Latin American eating so beans corn and squash and so those are the three sisters beans corn and squash and so those are again all starches so uh, get those starches in there and add vegetables to that whether you're making a taco or a burrito or a burrito bowl or whatever you want to make there and then oh yeah and some other ideas just the last thing i had here was besides some other recipes being casserole is uh oh and the quinoa tacos are really good we make those all the time so it's a Basically, you instapot quinoa, and then you put it on a. After it's cooked, you put it on a baking sheet and put in all these Mexican spices. And then you bake it in the oven, and then it's almost like the consistency of hamburger after you have baked it in the oven. And then we use that as our base of our of our tacos. So lots of that, and then some add some beans, some salsa, some avocado, tomato, lettuce, all that red sauce, you know, all that, and uh, so that's a good good replacer. So that's a, that's in the minimalist, on the minimalist baker website, the quinoa, how to do that. And then I just wanted to throw out some ideas too about meal, meal serving ideas, kind of, this is good for, for having a big gathering or you're cooking for a family that maybe some people want to be more plant-based and some people don't, but you just want to blend things together. It dirties up a few more dishes, but this really works well where you do kind of a theme, you do a, like a, potato bar or a pasta bar or a salad bar or a burrito bowl bar. So you have all the different ingredients. And so you have, for the people that are plant-based, you have maybe the quinoa, uh, quinoa, like almost like ground beef I was just talking about, or beans and um, you have your kind of your starches and stuff there. And then you can build your own, so you have all your own ingredients and you put it onto your, whether it's your pasta, your potatoes, your salad, your burrito bowl. And then, but then people that don't want to eat that way, you could still have some browned up hamburgers, some chicken, cheese. They can have regular sour cream if they want, whereas you, you know, you, you can make a tofu sour cream. It's really good. I know that's a recipe in the, in the Forks Over Knives cookbook. Super simple. You just take two of those. The batch that we make is you take two of those uh, just, uh, firm tofu um, boxes there in the they're on the shelf there. We we get ours at uh, Market of Choice. They're in the little blue uh, rectangles. You put two of those into your blender. It's two tablespoons of red wine vinegar and two tablespoons of lemon juice. And then you just blend that. And it's, it has the consistency of sour cream. And you, you chill it in the 
in the refrigerator for about an hour and that's what you use for your sour cream. And you know, of course it doesn't taste quite like sour cream initially, but once you've used it five, six, seven, eight times, it's kind of, it's cool. It's cool. It has the same consistency as sour cream. So that's what I put on like anything I'm going to, that I would have put sour cream on before, you know, my, on my tacos and burritos. And you know, so I'd even put a little bit as a, with along with my balsamic vinegar and it makes a good salad dressing for me. And I'll put that together and uh, so that works, works really well but uh, but so it works really well to have these kind of buffets of ingredients and so then everyone can be included and so everyone kind of builds their own bowl or their own plate and you know some people or that aren't plant-based they can kind of just put their normal things on and there's good but there's all kinds of plant-based ingredients that you can throw on yours to build your own plate or your own bowl so that's all I had there and Hope that's helpful, all the different resources. Does anybody have any questions about any of the resources I went over? I'll stop sharing my screen here. You can go back and watch the recording if you, if I went too fast through that, hopefully not too fast. I, I did have a question about, I, I really like that, um, the plant, or what is the? Plant the, powered families? No, the, when you check off all the, how many servings of beans and oh that, dr gregor's daily right dozen. thank you <laughs> but um i know like on there it says like a serving of greens is either a cup of raw like spinach or kale or half a cup of cooked and i just i know that when i cook spinach it just like goes down to like nothing and i just wondered do i get as much nutrition out of that as i'm getting if i didn't cook it yeah, i mean cook, cooked is what dr gregor always says is eat it however you're going to eat the most of it. So, so yeah, you're right. When you put spinach in your sauce or something, it, it, it cooks down to almost nothing, but you know, think of it as, okay, so I'm putting in, you know, three cups or four cups of spinach when it's raw, if that, you know, that would be like, you know, four servings or whatever, but you know, but it, you know, it depends on how much of you're eating at one time, but just put in as much as you can, you know, that you want to make it taste good and be the right, you know, consistency and the right flavor. You know, you don't want to overwhelm the change the taste of it too much. But I guess I wouldn't worry about it too much. But it, uh, it you know, consume it however it's going to be the, the most that you're going to get the most of it in. But there's not, you know, some of people say, well, we should probably try to go 50 50 raw versus cooked. But you know, I think a lot of the science on that is, you know, Dr. Gregor does have videos on what's the healthiest way to prepare different vegetables and things, you know, what do we lose some of the nutrients and, you know, there is some differences in, in nutrient loss when we cook things certain ways. So you can kind of peruse that those videos on nutritionfacts.org. But, but I think what, what kind of comes down to is if we're, you know, it's, it's small, it's small differences. And so I guess I would just go with, you know, eating, if you're eating mostly all whole food, plant foods, you're going to, it's going to be a win-win right there. Whereas if somebody's still eating, you know, bacon, double cheeseburgers and trying to eat more whole plant foods, then I don't worry so much for them to, you know, whether what's the healthiest way to cook, prepare something when they're still eating foods that are, that are bad for them. So it's like, if you're already completely plant-based, then we can kind of split hairs and, Hey, what's the best, what's the best way to cook different things. And that has some validity. Another question yeah, I have you're is confused. About if you're I'm confused sorry. about how much to, to use, I think that was part of your question. Do you go by the the raw one cup or do you go by what it cooks down to? I would go by the raw one oh. cup full, okay. like a handful uh, of the raw and whatever it cooks down to, consider that a serving. Okay, great. Yeah, good, good. I, Thanks, I I had another question about in some of those cookbooks I got I got the one um, how not to die cookbook and it it has it uses that white miso paste in there and I I bought some of that and it has so much sodium in it and I just wonder I mean it's kind of like getting a can of soup and so like if you if you used it in like a big pot of soup maybe it you know it would be like you, I think a tablespoon has like 800 milligrams or something and I just wondered if that's something that you try to avoid, or if there's a kind that doesn't have as much sodium, or it's really- uh, Greg, Gregor actually addresses that in his new book, How Not to Age. I uh, might do it in other places, but he's found that the sodium in miso doesn't seem to have the same effect. Oh, okay. Uh, 
uh, be either because of the fermentation and the other uh, phytonutrients. I can't remember the exact issue. Scott, do you remember? Uh, but but it's okay to eat the miso. Okay, thank you. And then I also I just wanted to report that I was able to get off my um, my cholesterol medication after like only like a month. I my cholesterol lowered from like 180 to 147. And my doctor said, okay, if you're on a plant-based diet, you can you can stop taking the statin, but get it checked again in like two months. And so I just thought that was pretty cool because I've been taking it probably for like 25 years or something. And, you know, yeah. Wow, great. Yeah, awesome. so anyway. Thanks. thanks for sharing that. Yeah, it's great. Uh, there is a, a question in, in the chat room, which I want to address quickly. Uh, Vera uh, asked it, and it's about thyroid. Uh, she said that she has a low uh, TSH and a little high T free T4, and she's got some thyroid peroxidase antibodies. And uh, Vera, if you uh, do a Google search uh, for Hashimoto's, uh, uh, if those values are correct, uh, you may find that it's sort of an autoimmune condition, which uh, we encourage people to do a whole food, plant-based, anti-inflammatory diet effectively uh, to cut down with the on the inflammation. Um, it's a it's something that you really need to have good explanation because sometimes your thyroid initially is overactive and then over time it can become underactive. So this is something you'll need to follow. And if you want further information, we'll talk with you privately about it, but uh, that's the best we could do for now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ross. Thank you. You're very welcome. Did, did Ed have a, his hand up? Yeah, Ed. So I was going to ask about um, the starch content in carrots. But yeah, we're posing a lot. After a quick Google search, it uh, seems like I may have been mistaken. <laughs> There's not a lot of starch in carrots, it's telling me. Right. It's not, yeah, it's, I guess it wouldn't be considered a starchy vegetable necessarily. It's a little bit higher on the, what we call the glycemic index, a little bit higher in, say, sugar, but. But in that form, in a carrot form, it's completely different than carrot juice, uh, for example. So don't, yeah, you can eat, feel free to eat lots of carrots. <laughs> They're fine. Yeah, but, but adding adding a ton of shredded carrot to a salad is not enough, not enough starch content. Yeah, no, you think about potatoes, sweet potatoes, beans, whole, any kind of whole grain like brown rice, quinoa, right. farro, amaranth, all those grains. And like little finger lean potatoes, things like that. Mm -hmm. Those are your starchy vegetables. Corn, corn would be a starchy vegetable. Corn and squash, for example. Because I think of it, it's a storage organ for a plant. Is the and so you know, I guess uh, some roots like turnips and stuff would be a little bit starchy. But I'm not. Yeah, I'm not sure all the ins and outs of what what you know what has more starch than another vegetable necessarily. Okay. Thank you. It's a good thought process. Yeah. Who else has a question? Otherwise, I'll we'll go right to Velvet. If anyone has any other questions about her? There her are just uh, three things. Uh, let's see the chat. I would just want to make sure that we got everybody. Uh, yeah, it looks like we got everybody here. And, oh, oh there's like Yolanda. a hand there, Yolanda and Tom. And then we'll get to Velvet pretty soon. I was just wondering if you have a, a good, reliable source for information on anti-inflammatory diets and foods. Yeah, it's right here, livelifestylemedicine.com. <laughs> yeah, so all, <laughs> all... I can... Okay. <laughs> Yeah, is there I'll, something I'll, on the website that has uh, specifically addresses that? We have a per, it's a perfect question. So all unprocessed whole plant foods are all anti-inflammatory. So you you want you know you want to okay. avoid things that are processed. You want to avoid okay. oils, animal products, 
those are all pro-inflammatory. So eating an anti-inflammatory diet would be a whole food, so completely whole food plant-based diet, unprocessed, no oil, no salt, no added sugar. If you're going 100%, you know, as much anti-inflammatory as you can, that would be the way to go. And, and uh, yeah, Dr. Greger on nutritionfacts.org does have some videos about, about anti-inflammatory, but that's kind of the, essentially the, the, the results of that. Just following okay. these classes, eating a whole food plant-based diet, that's your most anti-inflammatory. Thank you. And if you want two other additional backups, it's the Physician Committee for Responsible Medicine, pcrm.org, and it's drmcdougall.com. They're all going to be telling you pretty much the same thing with slight variation, but just what Scott said. Okay, thanks. I'm headed in the right direction. Good. <laughs> great, great. <laughs> Uh, can you guys hear me okay? We can hear you fine. I wanted to add to that. I have a friend with rheumatoid arthritis, and I found a physician, Dr. Dr. Monica Agarwal. She mm -hmm. wrote a book, Body on Fire, and it talks about, um, you know, inflammatory, uh, anti-inflammatory diets. So just thought I'd share that. That's a great one. I've seen I've seen her speak at conferences, and she actually had I haven't read her book, but uh, saw that she had books there after her lecture. People were people were she buying. She has a a book and a um, cookbook, and she actually had room. She has rheumatoid arthritis herself, and went from like having to like like after her second or third kid, I think it got really bad, and she couldn't even pick up her child like out of the crib. And it so then she discovered whole food plant based stuff and yeah it's a pretty cool story. Great. Anyways, if you guys are ready for me, go for it, Velvet. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Can you guys see that okay? We can. Okay. See if I'm pressing the right things. So um, I'm Velvet, if you guys don't know me, I haven't been here lately because I'm in nursing school and so I've been kind of busy with that. But I started doing this because I had colon cancer at 35 and so it's been a little over two years and I'm really enjoying it and seeing a lot of great benefits from it. So. I'm hoping this this helps you guys a little bit. Um, so the first thing I suggest is always having a plan. And I took a picture of my whiteboard here. And this is what I, we have hung in our kitchen. And so we plan out our dinners um, each week. And um, it has really helped us just stay organized. So like me or my husband can just make dinner and know what, what's happening that day. We don't really plan out breakfast and lunch because we don't really eat those meals together. But lunch is usually leftovers from dinner for me. <laughs> but um, also picking a day to go grocery shopping each week is really helpful. Um, and writing your list off of what you plan. And then knowing like what you like for breakfast. Each. I'll go over those things. Um, and then always having a backup plan has really helped me. So either um, just having like lots of pantry staples on hand, beans and rice and um, just some extra veggies that you can throw out. Frozen veggies are great. Like a thing of frozen broccoli you can make really quickly. So, and then um, also looking at restaurants around you. I know it's not the best thing, but if you have, if you need something quick last minute, knowing where you can go. And then um, I have, we have three kids, only one at home really right now because my oldest is off to college. <laughs> um, but I think it's helpful if any of you guys have kids getting your family involved and cooking and also picking those recipes um, and just start by switching your favorite meals to plant-based. So if you like lasagna, then 
you know, switch that to something plant-based and see what you like, experiment. Um, recipes online are free and there's so many out there. So they're everywhere. You don't even have to buy cookbooks, but I like to have the paper copy in my hand. So I've invested in a few. And then come to class and learn. And then I also talked already about researching restaurants around you. We have a great one in Medford where I live called Rooted. And Charlie's been there. And it's just a really great place. Um, I think in, in Eugene, you guys have a couple of places. But you just got to look and see what's available. It may not be the best, but it's always good to have those options. Um, for me, for breakfast, I like smoothies or tofu scrambles. Oatmeal's really been my go-to lately, oh, especially overnight oats. And I like to, um, Lisa Chick suggested, because I was putting maple syrup in my oatmeal, do a smashed banana to like sweeten it instead of maple syrup. I still add a little bit of maple syrup, but less than I was <laughs> just to cut down on the sugar. Um, and But overnight oats, it's game changer. <laughs> I swear by it, especially traveling. I will make overnight oats and just put them in the like hotel free fridge, hotel fridge or my friend's fridge, wherever I'm staying at. And then I can just wake up and not worry about having an option for breakfast at somebody else's house or having to eat a rest at a restaurant. Um, and then air frying potatoes is good. I've always really liked fried potatoes. So it's a great option that you can do without oil and then put like any kind of sauteed veggies and salsa and just kind of make a scramble or tofu scramble over the top of it. It's a good idea. And then for lunch, I'm big on leftovers from dinner. Um, and then salads are also great. Stir fries, um, if you're at home, whipping up just a quick stir fry with some veggies and some leftover rice. Um, I really like chickpea sandwiches, the chickpea tuna sandwiches. Those are really good. And recently I've been making, and this is totally out there and it's a lot of preparation, but it's really cool. I've been making raw vegan wraps and they have been so awesome, but it's like a salad and like a tortilla, but it's raw. So you're getting a lot of fruits and vegetables and not any sodium. So. It's been fun experimenting with those things. And then I actually have not eaten ramen in a really long time, actually since last year, and I should have deleted it off here. It's not a bad thing, but I buy the brown rice ramen. It's just not super high in fiber, and Charlie told me about it. But if you're transitioning, I think it's a great option, especially if you've liked ramen throughout your life. You can just make your own broth season it however you want, add a ton of vegetables. I'll add broccoli and peppers and carrots and onion and just make it however you want. I don't buy like the packaged ramen that has like the seasoning packets. I season it myself. So, and then for dinner, there's so many different options. I think like Scott was talking about, keep it simple. I have really, in the past year, I've started to like do a lot simpler. Some of the pictures you see here are a little, little bit fancier. They're from when I first started. And um, I've definitely simplified it a lot into like just stir fries, curry, spaghetti, um, baked potatoes with veggies like you see there, um, and tacos and like taco bowls. Bowls are your best friend. So starting with rice or quinoa or whatever grain you like and then just making beans and some veggies and salsa whatever else you want to put on there is a great idea and then I always love keeping bananas in my freezer and red tag bananas is something I found that's cheaper and we have them here in Medford at Food for Less so if you guys have a Sherms anywhere near you they typically will mark down the bananas if they're starting to turn brown. Because when you go to the grocery store, you usually see yellow or green bananas. They don't sell the 
brown ones because they just throw them out or I don't know what else they do with them, but usually I think they're throwing them out or donating them to farms for animals or whatever. But when they're turning a little brown, they're still good. And so I just peel them and put them on a, a cookie sheet like this and throw them in the freezer. And then I will just break them apart the next day and put them in freezer bags and they don't stick to each other after that. And I use them for smoothies, nice cream. If you guys don't know what nice cream is, it's like ice cream, but just made out of bananas. You can have strawberries, blueberries, make it whatever flavor you want. Um, it's a really great idea for kids if they want dessert. My son loves it. So it's good to have bananas on hand. Quick smoothie. And then um, prepare in bulk. So I like to make, when I make rice, I make three cups of rice because we have a lot of people in this house and it's a go-to thing. They'll just pull rice out of the fridge and throw stuff on top of it. And then like, if I'm doing baked potatoes, I'll make a few extra. So I have them for lunch throughout the week to do with some other veggies. Um. And then also if I buy like romaine lettuce or like a head of lettuce, I'll chop it and put it in a container in the fridge so that I can just grab it. And I don't have to worry about chopping it when I'm hungry because when I am come home from school and I'm starving, I need something quicker and I don't want to go grab for the unhealthy thing that might be around, which I don't have a lot of it in my house, but it does happen. I have children. <laughs> and then um buy in bulk so like I have started buying like especially the seasonings I use all the time I'll buy like the bigger containers of seasonings um because I go through a lot of seasoning and then rice nuts grains beans and bulk whatever you use a lot of I would suggest rice I've realized was a lot cheaper in bulk than buying the bags and then when I make salad dressing I'll make double the dressing so I have it throughout the week um, to use on whatever and especially like my um, ranch that I make I like to have it to like throw if I make steamed broccoli or potato I can just throw a little bit of my ranch on there and leftovers of course are your best friend some people don't like them I I live on leftovers and these are my favorite cookbooks Scott talked about them but the plant you cookbook I think is my top favorite I use it even more than three to four times a week. It's just wonderful. And earlier Scott mentioned blending your veggies to put like in a spaghetti sauce. She has a, I always say this word wrong. I might, bolognese. I think that's how you say it. It's like a spaghetti. My kids hate mushrooms. And I've realized if I use my Vitamix and just process the mushrooms down and throw them in the sauce. They don't even notice and they eat it. So it's a great idea to break them down if you don't like chunky spaghetti sauce. So you can do it with all of them. I do spinach and mushrooms, peppers, the cherry tomatoes. I just blend them and then put them in the sauce and they eat it. And then Be a Plant-Based Woman Warrior, which is by Esselton's. I think Esselton Stott Jane, Esselton, and then Plantifully Lean. I really, really like her book. I use it just as much as the Plant You Cookbook. She has a lot of great oil-free recipes um, that are really simple. And I like also that a lot of her recipes are like two or three servings. They're not huge. So sometimes I'll just make the recipes for myself to have for lunch for a few days or whatever during the week. And then The Inside Scoop by Nathan Maris. It's a whole nice cream book. And then Plant-Based Tips and Dressing by Melissa Raymondy. Raymondy. It's all oil-free plant-based tips and dressings. And I think that's all I have. Scott, how do I stop sharing? Oh, should be at the top. There we go. There, there stop go. sharing. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't find it. That's great. Velvet, does anyone have any uh, questions for Velvet? One thing I wanted to comment on when she mentioned free, uh, refrigerating uh, extra potatoes when you cook them, there's a little trick to that, that uh, it's actually better for you to do that because the starch that's in potatoes 
it becomes more of a resistant starch. So resistant starch acts in the body more like fiber. And so even though there's lots of fiber in potatoes, you actually get an even bigger kick of fiber by uh, after you cook potatoes, you cool them down in the refrigerator and then you can heat them up later in the microwave or whatever. And once, the, once that starch is cooled down in the refrigerator, it becomes more like fiber, this resistant starch. So it's an even healthier way to eat a starchy potato uh, is, is to refrigerate some leftovers. Nice. Eat them later. Um, one yeah. other thing about leftover baked potatoes, that plant with the Lilene book, she takes her leftover baked potatoes, like after they've been sitting in the fridge one or two days, they get cold. You cut them up into wedges and make like JoJo's out of them in the oven. Oil free, you just put them in a bowl, season them, shake it up really good, and they make the best JoJo's. Like, so good. Nice. Is anybody hungry? <laughs> <laughs> I am. Do you guys have any questions for me? Well, I have another question about the freezing things. And I, I read somewhere that you could freeze like kale and spinach. And I just thought, really? Have you ever tried that or anybody? I haven't. Okay. I eat it too fast to okay. freeze it. Sometimes spinach, though, I feel like that might be a good idea because I sometimes I have still a half bag and it's going bad and right because they come in yeah. such bags yeah okay I well maybe I should just try it it just doesn't sound like a very good idea but anyway <laughs> yeah <laughs> thank you another good option is to buy frozen vegetables and fruits and stuff too because it you know it's actually a lot of times even fresher because they they flash freeze it at the farm and then it gets then it gets shipped a ways whereas you know if you're buying fresh produce Sometimes it's been sitting around for a while. So it, what the nice part about buying already uh, or frozen vegetables and fruits is, especially the vegetables, is they're already cut up for you. So you don't. it saves a step. So you can just throw that onto your saute pan, all the, a mixed, you know, like a bag of mixed vegetables. If you're doing like a saute or something and you can just throw it right on there. And, and it's that's really healthy that way, really fresh. Are there questions or comments or does anyone want to sh share like their favorite breakfast or any kind of meal? Feel free. I do have a question. Um, yeah. I would like to know if you have any um, good cheese substitute recipes. I haven't made any myself. I know I mean, nutritional yeast is a good cheese substitute on, sprinkled on things, but I know there some of the cookbooks have like a like cashew cheeses and things, but most of the you know cheese that if you're going to buy an already made cheese, it's you know at the, at the store and they tend to be really expensive. But mo most of the some of the best ones are made from cashews. But uh, but yeah, a lot of times they have some salt added, some oils added to them sometimes. But it's more of a, a decadent thing, you know, or a you know if you go to a, get a vegan cheese at a restaurant or something like that, it tends to be a lot of salt and oil in it, but but I know you can make ones that are a little bit healthier versions, but I haven't, I haven't made any myself. I don't know. Have you velvet? Yeah, I've made a few. What kind of cheese are you looking for? Like, do you care if it's like a, like a sauce almost? Yeah, I think more of a saucy sauce cheese. I mean, so, I'm a cheese lover and um, I have eliminated it mostly from my dad. Every once in a while, I'll eat some cheese. But um, um, if I want something on a taco, which is where I would have put cheese, yeah, um, that's not a sauce necessarily. But if I want a cheese, I I just don't know quite to do. I've looked at some of the cashew recipes, but they're quite involved. I think. Do you have like a high power blender to be able to make like a cashew base? I, I don't. I I could okay. Be one but I don't at this point I don't so, have the equipment yeah so there's actually a recipe with potatoes and carrots that makes a really good like cheese sauce 
you can also add cashews to it but if you just want like a simple cheese sauce you just boil like yukon gold potatoes three of them this actually makes quite a bit so you cut the recipe down do you have a pen <laughs> i'll just tell okay, you really i quick. just broke my wrist today so i'm oh, sitting you in a, thing. my dominant hand is in a is in a nice big restraint. how about how about I email it to Scott yeah. and then he can okay. get it to you. Yeah, I would appreciate okay. that. Thank you. Okay. Then I'm not just burning Thank things you. off and you're going to forget Thank later you. because I know I would. Yes. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I just wanted to say that I've been um, freezing kale like crazy because I have, um, there's two, two women I work for who send me down the river with loads of kale every week and it freezes wonderfully beautifully i have it in a big bowl and i keep trying to figure ways to scoop some out to put it in a recipe and then as far as teas goes um you can use your coffee grinder to grind up a small amount of cashews and i just like for a pizza i just do that with a little bit of water in it and and use that as cheese on a pizza if i want um, a little richer pizza rather than just tomato sauce oh wow okay Oops, sorry. Going to tune out little yappy person here. Marsha. Does anybody around Eugene Springfield area know where you could get some inexpensive frozen collards or frozen kale? I know Market of Choice does, but they seem awfully high. Does anybody know anywhere else? <laughs> Frozen, frozen what? Collards, greens. Oh, collard, collard greens. Oh, I'm not sure. I've never seen them, uh, frozen collard greens. Okay, well, I know Market Choice does, so maybe I'll have to go back there. <laughs> All right, thanks. Yep. Anyone else? Uh, I have a question about peanut butter. Is organic peanut butter okay? Is it the kind that you stir? Yes. Yeah. So you want to just make sure you look at the label and make sure it just says peanuts is the only ingredient other than a little bit of salt sometimes. Because uh, there are sometimes peanut butters that they add oil to, they add right. salt or sugar to, for example. And so um, it's always you know best to eat just the peanuts, especially if you're trying to lose weight, but if people that are not trying to lose weight, some peanut butter is, is totally fine because it's just ground up peanuts. It's just a little high in calories. The calorie density is really high. So you're, you'll are you actually, if you eat a couple, like a handful of peanuts in a day, especially if you're trying to lose weight, just a handful of peanuts a day would be okay where peanut butter could get, could be a little bit of a slippery slope because if you're eating a lot of it, it's, you know, it's already been mashed down. And so per bite, it's a lot more calories than if you still are chewing the peanuts themselves and some of the particles go down into your intestine and, you know, don't get every single calorie of it when you're eating the peanut whole because some of it, small digest, undigested particles make it into your colon and things like that. Uh, so that's why it's always best to eat the nuts whole. But uh, again, if you're not, if you're not and having any awesome. weight issues, wow. then peanut butter, the nut butters are totally fine, especially if it's just that one ingredient. Uh, just a follow-up question. Uh, what about acrylamides? Uh, you know, does that argue for using raw peanuts rather than roasted peanuts or is that not a concern? Yeah, I mean, if, if you have a, something on that, Charlie, I think it's, you know, best yeah, to I would avoid say that that roasted. It, you do add, a uh, if you're gonna be uh, roasting uh, peanuts, uh, you're going to have increased amount of acrylamide um, or, you know, doing French fries. Uh, if you're heating them up with oil, you're getting acrylamide and it could be a concern. But if you're otherwise eating healthy, probably not a big deal. Uh, a little roasted is probably OK in your life. A little poison. OK, and I, know, and I know the amount is much smaller than if you were if you're heating up an uh, animal product to a high temperature, that's more of 
that's way, you know, potentially potentiates, you know, it's much higher difference in the animal product that high temperature versus a plant, you know, it goes up a little bit when you heat a plant food to high temperature, but not, but it's exponentially higher with the animal products. So. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so what Scott said about the uh, chewing the nuts up, you're getting, you know, when you chew, you're going to get less calories if you're trying to lose weight, but if you're not, uh, Gregor has it on his daily dozen, two tablespoons of nut butter, uh, nut or seed butter, it would be considered the serving of nuts for the day. Just FYI, some stores in their like um, bulk section have like where you can grind the peanuts down into peanut butter or almond butter. So you can just, instead of buying it in like a jar where there's excess stuff added to it, you can grind them right there by yourself. And for those of you who don't uh, like to stir your peanut butter, uh, who like to do it with a uh, stirless, uh, we were purchasing that for quite some time until we were confronted by Gregor with the fact that it's not a very healthy choice uh, because what allows it to become stirless uh, I can't remember exactly what it is. It's some fat, I guess. Uh, a, I don't know if it's actually saturated fat, but it's not healthy. Always Anybody learning else? things. Yeah, it's a continual issue, isn't it? <laughs> Every time, Charlie, you teach me something new, and I'm like, what? No. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, we we have loved using uh, stirless peanut butter. We didn't like to stir, stir it up every time until just about the last, I don't know, six months maybe, where we, uh, you know, Gregor set us back on the journey to healthier so peanut butter. if you're grinding them yourself at the store... Yeah, you don't really have to stir those. Is that you do? If you just let it sit there, it'll it'll get a. It never sits there a long the time for us. My kids you probably my eat it that uses. fast. Yeah, my right. husband uses it as oatmeal. My kids use it for sandwiches yeah. or whatever. So you don't have that problem. But most no. everybody else is gonna if if they just sit it around and eat it occasionally, it is gonna okay. separate. I always, I always put it in the refrigerator after I stir it, and then it's <laughs> it stays pretty firm, except for it usually gets a big hard thing in the bottom that it's hard to stir, but yeah. But I'll bet you there are a few of you in this room, if you buy peanut butter, buy the stirless kind, where you don't have to stir. Is that correct? Anybody? Maybe we were the only ones on the planet. But I don't I buy, think so. I buy it and stir it and then turn the jar upside down and stick it in the fridge. And the, any oil that's going to rise to the top actually then goes to the bottom. I see. But so, but I, that is a, a stirrable time. Yeah, that's yeah. stirrable. I prefer Yeah, stirrable. but they yeah. do sell stirless. Yeah. At a slightly higher cost, I believe. <laughs> And of course, the worst peanut butters are like Jif and Skippy and all those because they add coconut oil and sugar and a bunch of other preservatives and stuff to it. So that's like the worst. All right. Who else has a issue, a question? It could be on anything. It doesn't have to necessarily be on food choices, but that's what we're doing this week. But whatever you have. So, Karen, go ahead. Oh my, put my camera on for a second. So it's palm oil that they put into peanut butter, and that's got a lot of. Um, it's, it's got some saturated fats, but it's a pretty heavy fat, and it does tend to track into arteries pretty easily. Thank you for 
clarifying that for us, Karen. That's what it is. It's saturated fat from the palm oil, palmitic yeah. acid or whatever. Yeah, the tropical oils are the worst. <laughs> I have Coconut, a question. Palm kernel. Yeah. I have another question about the oil. Um, is it bad? I mean, like, you know, we talked about this before, like the olive oil is the best of the oils, but it's still bad. Is it because it can still clog your arteries? It's actually one of those things that causes inflammation. So it's a processed food. So anytime we eat a processed food, it's been refined, it's been stripped of the nutrients. So, you know, that olive, eating an olive is okay because the olive has got lots of fiber and nutrients and everything. And it's going to be have a different effect on the body than taking, you know, 40 olives and make to, it takes about 40 olives to make a tablespoon of olive oil. And you've stripped out all the nutrients and fiber and everything. So, you know, when you look at, uh, for those that are maybe are newer, you know, olive oil is, is, is considered an anti-inflammatory oil in comparison to coconut oil, palm kernel oil, lard, butter. So if you compare it to, to those things, is, which is what they tend to do in studies to be able to say, hey, this is the better choice. Well, yeah, it is the better choice, but you're better off without it because it is a processed food. It's not overall as a food, it's not an anti-inflammatory food. It's just more anti-inflammatory than the, the alternatives. And so we, it's always really important when we say is a food healthy or not, we'll compare it to what, because a lot of times the studies will compare it to something much worse. And so it looks healthier. It looks healthy compared to something that's really bad. So, um, so yeah, it's best to avoid the oil altogether, but it's, you know, hard to do if you're going to eat out occasionally, you're going to be getting some oil just the way it goes, but just try to avoid it when you can. Okay. Thank you. The key word here that Scott mentioned is inflammation. Chronic inflammation is sort of like uh, hitting yourself with a hammer in the knee, allowing your body to respond and heal itself up, and then hitting it again and hitting it again. That cro becomes chronic inflammation, and that's an underlying cause for so many of our diseases. And so the more foods that you eat that cause inflammation, such as the oils, the processed oils, not the oils from the whole food, but the processed oils, mm. the greater at risk you are of developing these diseases and the lesser life expectancy you will have. Now, it may be hours less or days less, but it could be weeks or years less, potentially, depending on what you expose yourself to. It's kind of interesting science, actually. If we had learned about this in, in school, in high school science or junior high science, we probably would say, why are we, why are we continuing to eat like this? Okay, Trouty. I have a question. What about salmon oil? Uh, is that clogging the arteries too? You're talking about fish, yeah, fish oil. So they have a no, lot of saturated fat. Not just any fish oil, just Alaska salmon oil. <laughs> yeah, so so the bigger the fish, the the fattier it is. So the salmon is is fattier than than trout or bass okay. or something like that. Because the more higher up the food chain you go, so salmon, you know tuna, all that, that's really high in, in, in fat. And so you're going to get some omega-3 anti-inflammatory fat in there, but that's only one part of it. When we eat a food, we can't just eat one nutrient. We're eating the whole food, the, the whole salmon. And so by eating the oil of a salmon, you're getting saturated fat, you're getting cholesterol, you're getting the pollutants and everything else. And so, yeah, you might be getting a little bit of healthy fat in there, but you're getting all the other bad stuff with it. So you're better off not eating or taking salmon oil or eating any fish because of the downsides to it. And the pollutants he talks about are mercury, dioxin, plastic mm -hmm. beads. Those are the pollutants that you're getting as you eat higher up on the food chain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that something that sounds pretty healthy? I don't think so. 
<laughs> and Trouty, if you want to watch something that will really help you not want to eat fish ever again, Sea Spiracy yep. is a sea really spiracy. good one to watch. Excellent. It is disgusting how they farm salmon. It is absolutely atrocious. And these fish are like so diseased and just, uh. Or You Are What You Eat on Netflix that just came out actually has a good little portion of it that talks about um, salmon. And they actually dye salmon in the store to make it look like that pinkish color that you know, makes it more it's, it's um, palm, aesthetic. Palm, palm mate, yes. Yeah. Palm weight, yeah. But you have to be careful about the labels because even though it doesn't say like farms, there's still they there's a lot of marketing schemes to get you to think, oh, like grass fed is healthier. It's just like that. So. Thank you for sharing that, Velvet. Uh, anyway, guys. Seaspiracy. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, Seaspiracy Seaspiracy is, really is on one. Netflix, I believe. You guys have a wonderful night. I'm okay, gonna thank you. Yes, for thanks for inviting me to do this. It's always fun. I really enjoy it. And I'll try to get back into one of these soon. <laughs> so right, thanks, have a good night, guys. Bye. Good seeing you. Bye. Thanks again. You too. Thank you. And hopefully you guys unfreeze soon. Yeah. I've been Thanks, seeing Christine's pictures and it's ah. awful. I feel so bad for you. And Malachi was skating across the ice the other day. Wow. <laughs> I was like, don't fall, please. Yes. <laughs> Have a good night, guys. You too. Bye. Bye. So any last questions or if not, we'll be good for the night, I suspect. We tell you that only to encourage you to ask another question, if you like, before we go. I'm looking around the room to see if there's anybody who is raising their hand. Hi, Dr. Ross. Hey, Lisa. So good to see you. Good to see everyone. I just logged on, so I missed most of the class, but I just wanted to say hi. It's been really busy on my OB rotation, but really good. Well, I I hope you're enjoying catching those little weekly creatures uh, <laughs> as they come out and, and you hold your breath, waiting for them to take a breath. There's those moments of anxiety, and then it's kind of fun after they cry and you know, exciting yeah, rotation yeah. for you. Yeah, you know, most of the midwives are doing the deliveries and all the OBs are, they're doing more of the gynecologic surgeries. <laughs> Is that but, it? Yeah, at least what it seems so far. But okay, <laughs> well, keep having fun. Thanks for signing in, checking Anytime. in. Okay, any last questions here from anybody? You got some great information from uh, Scott and Velvet, and yeah. hopefully uh, this will be, you know, something that's simple for you. Just remember, you don't have to spend a bunch of money uh, to get recipes. They're all free online. You all can get online because you made it on Zoom. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you could search around for different recipes. And if you don't like to cook, you can make no cook meals pretty much. Uh, we'll try to review that again next week briefly. And then next week, I'm going to go into a little bit, if you want a more, a little more complex breakfast than your simple cereal and milk, and uh, fruit, uh, we'll show you how you can make it a little more uh, exotic. Uh, some people feel it's overwhelming, but trust me, you don't have to incorporate everything that my wife and I incorporate into breakfast, but I think you'll be kind of surprised at how much food we actually eat and the variety. And uh, we'll share some other tidbits with you next week about 
food preparation and we'll try to simplify it toward the end for you as best as possible. This can be fun. Think of it that way. And it actually can be healthy for you. And, um, you know, you're, this is a new journey for you. It's like you're going on a different vacation to a new foreign land, uh, changing your diet can be fun. Scott, thank you so much. You're welcome. Anybody yeah, else? thanks everybody. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. You're Very welcome. Helpful. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Till next week. See you next week.